How is it that one artist could paint this and this in one lifetime? For centuries, it was the artist's job to represent the world around them. Throughout the years, they got better and better at representation. Giorgio Vasari, an Italian art writer during the Renaissance, was quoted as saying, Design cannot have a good origin if it has not come from continual practice in copying natural objects and from a study of pictures by excellent masters and of ancient statues. E. H. Gombrich, who was born in 1909 and died in 2001, was a 20th century art critic. He takes a look back at the abrupt transition from realism to abstraction. Gombrich is quoted as saying, John Constable's painting of Wivenhoe Park looks so natural and obvious that we are inclined to overlook its daring and its success. We accept it as simply a faithful record of what the artist actually saw in front of him, a mere transcript of nature. As paintings of this kind are sometimes described, an approximation at least to that photographic accuracy against which modern artists have rebelled. Gombrich thought this to be the last series of paintings through art history to be concerned with making and matching or representation. Perhaps he was right. In 1826, only 10 years after the Wivenhoe Park painting was painted, the first photograph ever was taken in France. This would forever change the course of art history. Impressionism was the style of art in the mid to late 19th century. Impressionism wasn't concerned with overbearing detail. Impressionism was more about capturing a fleeting glimpse of light through color and brushwork. This painting of haystacks by Claude Monet depicts warmth from the sun, something the early primitive camera could not do. Perhaps this early invention challenged artists to change stylistically to capture nature around them in a different way. The camera was just one of many technological advancements that affected society and the arts in the late 19th century. Paul Gauguin and Vincent van Gogh were friends and painted during the same time period as Monet. However, they were both considered post-impressionists. These two artists propelled the direction of art history further into abstraction. For the first time, artists were much more capable of traveling around the world, thus adding to a plethora of influences that would change their artistic visions departing even more from representational or realistic artwork. Gauguin traveled several times to Polynesia where he was influenced by its culture and art forms. Although Van Gogh never traveled to Japan, he was influenced by Japanese art, especially the linear aspect of Japanese woodblock prints. Let's take a look at early and late paintings from both artists as we see an advancement from realism into abstraction. Although Gauguin and Van Gogh were revolutionary in their styles, it was Cezanne, the father of Cubism that bridged the divide between realism and abstraction. Cezanne took an even further departure from realism as he visually brought paint to the surface while simplifying objects in his paintings into basic geometric shapes. It was Cezanne's artwork that inspired Picasso to invent the style of painting called Cubism. 
You might be asking yourself throughout this video, what does abstraction actually mean? What is it? Well, abstract art focuses more on an idea or a concept rather than a representation. Abstraction is the ultimate freedom for an artist to express themselves. As we cross over into the 20th century, let's take a look at abstract art and the works of Picasso, Matisse, and Mondrian. Picasso was classically trained at a young age. Both of these paintings were done at 13 years old. In Cubism, Picasso explored the idea of four dimensions, or time. How would a still life look if you could paint it from multiple viewpoints? In addition to the concepts of time and point of view discovered in Cubism, Picasso was also influenced by the ideas of form and structure found in African masks. We can see this influence in his portraiture. Although Picasso started out at a young age painting realistically, he dedicated his life to explore the abstract. He was quoted as saying, It took me four years to paint like Raphael, but a lifetime to paint like a child. Henry Matisse also started out classically trained in art as well. As Matisse's artwork progresses through his life, we can see the exaggeration of color in his portraiture. He starts to simplify his landscape paintings, and he also explores the idea of flattening out his interior spaces with multiple patterns. Toward the end of his life, Matisse submerses himself simply in the exploration of color and shape. As Mondrian explored the landscape, he found beauty in the linear structure found in trees. Using trees as a visual motif, Mondrian reinvented his compositions by improvising with lines and color, similar to what a jazz musician would do, only using scales and notes. Mondrian often thought, what would music look like if you could paint it? After Mondrian moved to New York City, his late painting titled Broadway Boogie Woogie depicted the street structure of Manhattan and the idea of color repetition and rhythm that would have been found in the early sounds of American jazz and blues music, which Mondrian loved. The artwork of Picasso, Matisse, Mondrian, and many others gave birth to modernism and many other art styles later on in the 20th century, including abstract expressionism, pop art, and postmodernism. This was my cousin Marion Powers in 1976. And this was Marion when she was a little girl. Who would have ever thought that in one person's lifetime she would start out traveling by horse and witness people traveling to the moon and returning safely to the earth. And so it is with the advancements in art history. After all, doesn't art imitate life? In just a few generations we have gone from copying the world around us on a canvas to an abstract representation of ideas, philosophies, and concepts. I often wonder, where will the next hundred years take us?